Good morning, everybody. How do you like my new background? Yeah, it looks cool. No, it's a chemical plant I worked at. Wow. In Louisville, Kentucky. I need a bigger desk. Oh no, I'm shimmering. <laughs> Let's see. That would be K and L reactors over my shoulder. All right, let's get started. I don't know where everybody else is, but I'm here, you're here. Good morning. 
All right, let's get to work. And what I didn't do it well enough yesterday, and before we get going, I messed up on something on this computer. I actually have three computers in my office, and I accidentally wiped off the video from yesterday. I'll be more careful, but things happen. All right, normally today, which we won't be doing other than right now, we'll have a lab introduction. And can everybody see the Solvis Chem Lab? Is that, a, okay, I see someone give me a thumbs up, thank you. All right, and what we'll be doing is I'll be giving an introduction to the lab. You'll do later that day. It'll take about 10 to 20 minutes, and then I'll continue with lecture. And just quickly today, I will like go over this again. You'll be doing the labs online and also with my handouts with Labster. The Labster part you'll do later in the day or the next day. You have until the following lab period to do it and get it done. And I went through how to go through and register to Labster. Here's our course code. And important thing, lab reports, and I'll talk about that in a second, are due the next lab session after the session, the lab report being done is handed in. <clears throat> so this Thursday's lab, you'll have until next Tuesday, next lab period, to get it done and hand it in. And how you hand it in, I have it set up, and today, I, I'll, later today, I'll post the labs you can download that I'll talk about on Thursday that you'll have until next Tuesday to upload it. Uh, I have to look at some of the Labster labs to see how I'm going to do it. But anyways, for most of our labs, that's how you'll do it. Now, you'll get zero lab points if you don't have uh, zero points if you don't hand in your lab report. If you get it late, you'll lose two points. If you're more than eight days late, zero points. In other words, the last day of the semester, I don't want somebody coming in here, my 10 lab reports, you've got to do it. No, I'm quite busy. Lab reports are PDF files. Also have them as Word files. If you don't have a printer, you don't have to write out all the questions that you'll be answering or data. Just write down the basic what data you calculated or, and also the answers to your questions. And I'll be posting later today or tomorrow a file, how instructions, how with a cell phone, if you don't have a scanner, to create a single PDF file from pictures you take with your cell phone. Because I'm going to assume everybody in our class has access to a cell phone that allows you to take pictures. All right. And just to go over real quick, here's our schedule. Today I just talking about it sometime today, not now, but later today before Thursday, actually next Tuesday, because that's when you'll need it and afterward, you should log in and make sure you're able to set up your course and logged in in Labster. Also Thursday, what I'll do is talk about density and I have a handout, which I finished this morning. It looks really good. I think you'll like it. And Here's one thing, a uh, link, there are better links also in the lab I have. And that's our lab for this morning. Let's get to work, but before I, we do, in case you came in late, over my shoulder here and here, this is part of a lab, uh, lab a uh, chemical plant in Louisville, Kentucky. Most people, like all people, usually don't get to see the inside of a chemical plant. Later in the semester, I'll talk how I got pictures there. I actually helped open up this lab, this lab. I got lab on the brain, hold on. There, I got it out. Uh, ooh, it's bad humor morning again. But anyways, I helped uh, commission this new addition. This 
these, you can't see them, but they're four reactors. This is a small part of the plant, cost a hundred million dollars to build and I helped open it up. It was exciting. I'll talk about it more during the semester. All right, one thing I shouldn't mention, you should be looking at the videos because it's an internet course. I'm really not supposed to do full lectures, but I am doing a lot of lecturing, more than you'd normally see in an internet course but that will help you. All right, let's get to work. Talking about measurements, and when you measure something, your number has a certain uncertainty to it. If you look at a thermometer and you read it, even a digital readout, and it says 95.7, the 0.7 is sort of uncertain. The first two numbers are. And those are things we call, have a name for it. Now, if you're just measuring objects, like how many people in the room, we call that exact numbers. When you're taking a measurement, a measurement has so many what we call significant figures. And uh, in one of the videos that I have on the list I sent you, I go through this in detail. You might want to watch it because I'm going through it a little faster rate because you have those videos. And any digit, uh, significant figures are digits in a measurement that are known plus one that it's unknown or uncertain, not unknown. Now, I'll never ask you to repeat or regurgitate on a test what are the rules or guidelines for determining significant figures, but I expect you to know this. Dr. White can be very subtle. Hint, you should know the following ways of determining how many significant figures in a number. Hint, big hint. See how subtle I can be? All right, let's go through this. Uh, we'll also practice it. All non-zero numbers are significant. All non-zero numbers are significant. Zeros may or may not be significant. Wow, that's helpful. Eh. But anyways, lead zeros at the beginning of a number are never significant. When you have zeros at the beginning, they're never significant. Remember, anything you're seeing right now, these slides are available to you always on D uh, Blackboard. I almost said the uh, system of the other school I teach at D2L. All right, confined zeros, those between numbers, non-zero numbers are significant. Trailing zeros, those at the end of a number are significant if a decimal point is actually present and trailing zeros at the end of a number are not significant if the number lacks an explicitly shown decimal point. In other words, if you see the decimal point and there's zeros at the end, they're significant. If they're not, no decimal point, those zeros at the end are not. Now, one other thing, exact numbers I'll talk about. And exact numbers are things that you measure. If I were, if we were in a classroom, and I asked how many students are in the classroom, you can't come up with the number. Well, there's an 11 and a half students in the classroom. No, I don't think we're going to have half a student. Oh, that's gross. Yeah. But anyways, you can't. Same thing if I ask if you were at COD. How many cars are in the parking lot in this park? Or better yet, how many yellow cars are there, or blue or red? Well, you're not going to tell me, well, there's 11 and a half or 11 and a quarter cars. No, I don't think you're going to find a quarter, half, or three quarters of a car in a parking lot. At least I hope you don't. And those are exact numbers. Also, numbers that are in a formula or a definition are exact numbers. 
And that's what we mean by integral numbers that are part of a equation or defined quantities, like how many eggs in a dozen, 12. That's an exact number. All right, let's do some practicing. Hold on one second. Can everybody see that number now? Yep, thank you. All of you with your thumbs up, thank you. All right. How, the question would be, how many ex significant figures are in this number? Well, we see a one, that's non-zero, a two, that's non-zero, a five, that's non-zero. So the answer is there are three significant figures. Let's do another one. I'll let you try this one. How many significant figures, again, I do rhetorical questions, how many significant figures are in that number? I see somebody already answered it, but you don't have to do it on the chat. If you want to, feel free to, but everybody else who's doing it, don't look at the chat. I'll give you 2.1 seconds. 2.0, 2.01. times up. Now, how do you tell? Non-zero numbers are always significant. One, two, three, four. So this has four significant figures. Let's come over here. Question would be, how many significant figures is in this number? And now all non-zero numbers are significant. So that's two. Lead zeros in the front are never significant. So this would have two significant figures. And I'm going to share the fun. How many significant figures are in that number? Your turn. I'll give you two more seconds. One, slow clock, two, time's up. All right, let's look at this. Non-zero numbers are always significant. One, two, three. Lead zeros are not. So this would have three significant figures. Let's continue on. This is an important skill to have. If we look at this number, and the question is, how many significant figures? Non-zero numbers are always significant. Zeros at the end with no decimal are not. So this would have four significant figures. Your turn. How many significant figures in that number? See how nice Dr. White is? He shares the fun. Can I give the answer? No, let's uh, give everybody time. Uh, when I do it in a classroom, it's more rhetorical. But if you want to put it on the chat, you can. I see some people already have, which is good, but let's do this now. And the question is, how many significant figures in this number? 
Well, non-zero numbers are always significant. Zeros at the end without a decimal, and there's no decimal point, get your magnifying glass and you'll see it's not there, are never significant. So this would have three significant figures. Now, zeros at the end with a decimal point are significant. So let's take a look at this. Non-zero numbers, always significant. Zeros at the end with a decimal. So this would have four significant figures. Let me do another one. This one, we have two non-zero, and notice when I make it a little larger, there's a decimal. This zero plus these are at the end, even though this is in front of the decimal, when there's a decimal point, zeros at the end are significant. So this would have one, two, three, four, five significant figures. Your turn, how many significant figures? And again, it's a rhetorical question. If you're not sure what the term rhetorical means, later on, look it up on Google. By the way, I'm old school. I never rarely use Google as a verb. For those who don't know what a verb is, well, take English. Well, I still remember everything I learned from grammar school and high school English. College English was interesting too. All right. I'll give you two more seconds. Ah, time's up. How many significant figures? And on a test, if I ask two or three points, how many significant figures in the following number? This has one, all non zero numbers are significant. So that's three. Ooh, there's a decimal. Zeros at the end with a decimal are significant. So this would have four significant figures. Let's continue on. Zeros that are, that are confined. Oop, hold on. Zeros that are confined in between numbers are always significant. So this would have one, two, three, non-zero. I'll get to whoever asked the question on chat in a second because I can't see it. And then we have a zero here. And therefore, this has three non-zero numbers, one significant zero. And once again, we're four. Hold on while I do this. Okay, everybody's getting it done. Now it's your turn. How many significant figures, and take your time, are in that number? Now, I should mention the more significant figures, the more accurate the number. All right, let's do it. All non-zero numbers are significant. One, two, three, four. Ooh, zeros. They're confined. That's significant. So this would have one, two, three, four, five, six significant figures in it. The more significant figures a number has, the more accurate a number, a measurement is when you're taking a, a number, a measurement. Now, when you're doing calculations, there are rules for what, how many significant figures should be in your number. And in order to do that, say you get a calculator and it gives you eight significant figures, but your answer should only be seven or six, you have to round off. And rounding off is the process deleting unwanted non-significant figures from a calculation. You probably know this, but let's go through it again. 
And the rules are the first digit to be deleted, if it's four or less, simply drop it and everything that follows, if it's past the decimal. If number is greater than one, you just replace everything you drop and that number by zeros. If the first digit to be deleted is five or greater, then the digit, that digit and everything else, if the number is one or less, is dropped and the one in front is increased by one. I think you'll understand it better when I do some examples. Let's go back to my whiteboard here. Let's look at this number. It has four significant figures. What if you had to round it off That's supposed to be an R. And I'll use sig fig for abbreviation. How do you do that? Well, you come here, you keep the first one, keep the second one. This is the third one. Now use this number to round off. And is that four or less or five or higher? I hope you know. Yes, it's five or higher. So I'm going to drop this and increase this by one. So the correct answer is 13.5. Now, how would you round this number off to two significant figures? Keep this, keep this. This is the number used to round off. Is that four or less or five or higher? And time's up. Hopefully, I'll pick four or less. Now, notice this number is a lot greater, no decimal. You're not past the decimal. So, here, this is going to be dropped and it's going to be replaced with a zero. So, the correct answer to round that off to two significant figures remember, zeros at the end with no decimal are not significant. So, that's how you do it. Now, most of the time, you're going to be working with numbers like this in scientific notation. So let's do one. How would you round this off to three significant figures? Well, this you keep. That's one. That's your second. Remember, zeros past the decimal is significant. So this is the first number to round off. Is that four or less? And the answer is, well, it's four, so it's four or less. So I'm going to just drop that. So the answer would be that. Now. Why don't you round this off round that off to four significant figures? And when you're done, either give me a thumbs up on if your video's on, or if your video's not on, give me a clap or a thumbs up. Everybody done? Okay, let's do this. How do you round this off to four significant figures? Keep this, keep this, keep this, keep this. Non zero numbers are always significant. And then, the one we're going to use to round off is the first number after the last one we're going to keep. This is four or less or five or 
higher. Eight is five or higher. So we're going to drop this, drop that, and increase this by one. The 10 to the fourth is never changed when you're rounding off. And that's how you do it. Now, one of the questions you should be asking is, why am I learning this stuff? How, why is, is it anything important? And the answer is, yes, it is. And it's time for a Dr. White story, true story. Now, I work for a company, Axo Chemie, that bought from another company, Unichemo. And I was in charge, part of my job as a research manager, any problems at the plant, they called me in, come and solve it. And we bought a certain chemical from another company called Unichemo Chemicals that we bought important raw material. And any chemical you buy, there's specifications set up certain measurements. It's like if you were to go out and buy a car and you say, oh, I want a red or a blue car. If you said I wanted a blue car and they call your cars here and it's yellow, that's not what I specified. Well, chemicals are like that. There's certain measurements and there's a certain important measurement called iodine value, abbreviated IV. And we are having problems with the raw materials from Unichemo and is causing me problems in the plant. So I called Unichem and said, look, you're having these problems. Let me help you out. And I helped solve their problem, which made my life easier. Well, it impressed the CEO of that company and the people there that they called me and said, we have this plant that we're also opening up a research on the south side of Chicago. I was working, when I was working at Unic uh, AXO, I was by Brookfield Zoo in McCook. And I said, well, let me talk to you. And they called me in, I interviewed for this job and they made me an offer I couldn't refuse. What was that? They doubled my salary. Trust me, that was nice. And I went to work for them and now I was shipping to people I used to work for. Well, for this one chemical called oleic acid, there's a specification that it had to be 95% minimum, or 95 minimum, not percent, minimum on the iodine value, IV. And anything that's shipped from a chemical company has what's called a certificate of analysis. Some companies call it COA, others call them certs. I like COA better, but I've worked for both companies that call them both. And before that chemical leaves the plant, it has to have a signed certificate analysis from the laboratory manager. I lab, I'm one of the few R&D chemists, PhD chemists, who in their lifetime manage both research and quality control lab at the same time or any time. Interesting experience. But anyways, we were shipping four tank wagons. And let's get some real life. For those of you who don't know what a tank wagon is, this is a tank wagon, like the ones that deliver gasoline to gas stations. They're standardized, 5,000 gallons, 40,000 pounds. We were shipping four of them at one time, and my lab came to me with this best measurement, iodine value, IV, 95.2. Well, it was above the minimum, so I didn't like it. It was pretty close, but you could do the iodine value to three significant figures. And so I shipped it. Well, the QC manager, when you work at a company, when you get a shipment of important chemicals, you measure important specifications. And they got an IV of 94.8. And he called me up and said, we're rejecting this. We're shipping those four tank wagons back to you. By the way, that's $200,000 in chemicals we're talking about, it's a lot of money. So I said to this QC manager who I knew, I think it was Bill, I said, Bill, you got a copy of the contract in your office, right? Pull it out, I'll get mine. We opened it up, we all had a contract, in contract, you have specifications. I said, 
mine reads 95 minimum. What do you have? 95 minimum. How many significant figures? Two. You got 94.8, round it off to two significant figures. 95. I got 95.2, round it off. I got 95. I'm at the minimum. You can't reject it. Oh, was he pissed at me? Excuse my language. I mean, really upset. And he said some nasty words at me. And I said, you know, I understand you're upset. And I'll tell you what, next week I'll come down to, and this was in Morris, Illinois, which I'd been to many times because I helped open part of that plant when I worked for the other company. I'll take you out to this nice restaurant. And he, we both knew I was going to get him good and drunk. Oh, it helps if you can hold your liquor when you get people drunk. And I took him out and he was happier. When I took him out, I promised that will never happen again. We'll never ship you anything that close. You have my word. And I went back. And the next day, I talked to the plant manager and I said, even though the spec is 95 minimum, I will not sign anything that's lower than 95.6. Now the plant manager got mad at me. And he went to our boss and yelled and complained. And my boss called me in. That was Pratt Dahmer, great man, taught me how to be a senior manager really well. Great German uh, chemical engineer, really taught me well. He called me and I told him what it was. He called the production man, plant manager, and said, Dr. White's right. I agree with him. And Mike, Mike Newton, who was Australian, was still pissed. I took him out too. By the way, when I take people out for dinner, when I was at those companies, I had an Amex card, American Express. My limit was 50000 a month because sometimes I'd buy equipment or sometimes I'd go to Europe and other places for long periods of time. And, <laughs> But anyways, significant uh, figures play a role in rounding off in many contracts that are used in chemical industry and others. And that was a nice Dr. White story, true story. Don't tell anybody I get people drunk to make them happy. Now, when you're using significant figures, and since I'm still new to Zoom, everybody, someone give me, can you see the operation rules on the screen? Yep, thank you. I'll never ask on a test, but you'll need to know how to do this. For multiplication division, the number of significant figures in the answer is the same as the number of significant figures in the measurement that contains the fewest significant figures. Again, the number of significant figures in the answer is the same as the number of significant figures in the measurement that contains the fewest significant figures. You'll be doing a lot of multiplication division on tests, and you'll need to know how to do this. I'll never ask you for the rule. Now, when it comes to addition and subtraction, we won't be doing any subtraction, but addition is a little funkier, and that is the answer has no more significant figures to the right of the decimal point than are found in the measurement with the fewest digits to the right of the decimal point. Now, let's go through some of this so you have an understanding what's going on. Let's look at this number. And let me just do a check. I'm pretty sure everybody see it? 2.0 times 2.0. Thank you. I'm getting pretty good at Zoom. All right. Well, 2 times 2 is 4. But that's wrong. This is two significant figures. Non-zero number, zero past the decimal. This is two, so same number non-zero, zero past the decimal. Therefore, this should be two significant figures. How do we do that? That. Now, if I were to do this, what would be the answer here? Here we have 
three significant figures. Here we have one, it's four, but this is one, so that's the lowest number. So the answer is here. And what that shows you is when you have more exact numbers, you get a more exact answer. When you have a less exact number times a more exact, you get a less exact number, which is not exact, accurate number, less significant figures. Now, where this plays an important role I'm setting up a spreadsheet, hold on. If we're doing something like this, So I have 16 times 3.00. And my calculator gives me something like this, or let's do another one. My calculator gives me this. Now, what I started with were these numbers up here. This is four significant figures. This is three. So even though my calculator gives me this with a ton of significant figures, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, you have to round this off to three significant figures. Keep the one, keep the five, keep the eight. The zero is used to round off and pass the decimal, everything else you drop, that's four or less. So the correct answer would be 15.8. And that's how you do that. Let's do another one. Now, each one of the numbers I was, had four significant figures. Let me just do a quick check. Everybody see the spreadsheet? Thank you. And I'll let you round this off to four significant figures. Time's up. <clears throat> Put down your pens and pencils, hand in your computer. Uh -uh. Anyways. Keep the seven. Keep since both are four, I, our final answer should have four significant figures. And keep the seven. Keep the one. Zero can find the significant. Keep that. This is number four. This is what I used to round off. It's four or less. So this the correct answer here would be seven point one zero five. And that's how you use multiplication or division. You always get the same, uh, your answer should have the same number of significant figures as the number that has the fewest significant figures. And addition, let's do a real quick one. I'm adding these two numbers. This is what I would get, but notice here you have two past the decimal. Here you have three significant, therefore your answer should only have two. How do I round this off? This side of the decimal, you don't play with. 
Therefore, I would drop that. It's four or less, and the correct answer here is six point uh, eight point six two. Let me show you for this one. If you add it up on a calculator, you get this, but notice this has one past the decimal. This has two, which is the lower number one. How do you round this off? You keep that. That's the one you used to round off. You drop that. So the correct answer here is three, one, two, five, point five. And people wonder, well, this is four, this is two, four, six. How come this is five? How about doing stuff here? Well, you only worry about past the decimal. And it took me a while to get my head around that, but that's that. All right, let's move on. There's two basic types of measurement units. One is the English, the other is metric. In the United States, we use the English and chemical plants too. When I go to Europe, which I have, one, everybody uses the metric, same thing in Canada, and even in chemical plants. Now, some of this I'm not gonna ever ask on a test, but you should look through. Metric comes from the word metrome, which means measurement. I'm never asked that. There's units of measure. Length is the meter. Why do my volume is liter? Mass is gram. And we have prefixes. Notice a gram, one kilogram equals a thousand grams. Well, there's certain key prefixes, which mean you multiply the gram unit, like an example here, times a kilo, which is 10 to the third, a thousand. Now, there are a couple of these I want you to know. That one, that one, and that one. So if I ask on a test, what is the prefix centi mean? 10 to the minus two, milli, like in milliliter, a thousand, 10 to the minus three, kilo, 10 to the third, or a thousand. If you ever watch movies or Miami Vice, for those who remember that show, I do, great show, or TV shows, and they say on the TV show, what time is the shipment coming in? Well, there's a hundred keys or a thousand keys of let's pick your favorite, whatever drug, cocaine coming in at midnight by boat. What do they mean by keys? They're talking about kilograms, which is the unit, I guess, drug people do that. No, I never deal with drugs or anything like that. And no, I've seen a little of Breaking Bad and I could do much better than a white and Breaking Bad. All right, important thing. What this means is, we have finished chapter two. On tomorrow, summer goes quick. I'm gonna go through some of the problems on chapter two, practice problem. Oh, I almost forgot. Uh, one of your colleagues was nice enough to point out that problem 5E, I believe it is, is wrong. I'll go over the right answer tomorrow in my answer key. Like I've said, I don't walk on water unless it's frozen, even then I stay off it, which means once in a while I do make mistakes. Uh, who do I have time for a quick story? I do. Uh, after I finished my PhD orals, defense of my PhD, I was about ready to leave. My advisor, great man, Dr. Roosh at Michigan State, called me into his office and said, I got an important piece of advice for you. I said, what? He said, 
never ever open your thesis again. Why? I said, you'll find mistakes. Wait, I proofed it many times, you proofed it, another professor. I had people in my research group, I think four of them proof it, said, doesn't matter, you'll find mistakes. So about a year later, somebody I had on my coffee table in my house, uh, someone came in, oh, can I see it? And I sh op we opened it up and immediately I saw a small mistake. And about a year later, I did it again and saw another small mistake. And I said, hmm, I'm gonna hide this. I still have my diploma, I know where it is, but I've never opened it up again because I'll find a small mistake. And anyways, there was a mistake in there. All right, let's move on because this is summer. All right, let's talk about chapter three. Chapter three starts out talking about what's matter. Matter is anything that has mass, means how much it weighs and occupies space. Matter report, re, uh, mass report, uh, refers to amount. I'll never ask on a test what matter is, but it's good to know what matter is because that's what chemistry is the study of. Now, matter has certain states. And it's time to find out once again, Dr. White can be subtle. See at the bottom, hint, know this. There are three states of matter. The first one is a solid. And a solid, you know, and you should know this definition. Hint, ooh, you got everybody's attention. Know this, see how subtle I can be? I can be goofy too. Solid has definite shape and definite volume. And you don't have to worry about incompressible. I should have deleted that. Anyway, solid has definite shape and definite volume. A liquid has indefinite shape, but definite volume. What does that mean? Well, let's get personal. Here I have my beaker mug of tea. If I were to pour this into a container that's square, the liquid would take up the shape of a square. Think about when you're making ice cubes. If you have an ice cube tray like mine, they're square. If the liquid is here, it's round. And that's because liquids have indefinite shape, but the volume, oh, by the way, see the volume measurements on my mug? I have it over here, time out for a drink. Oh, by the way, today is uh, caramel vanilla tea from Republican Tea, one of my favorites. And finally, a gas has indefinite shape and indefinite volume. And what that means by indefinite volume is if you walk into a room, and if I were to have a skunk let loose at the other side of the room, within a little while you'd smell it because the skunk let loose a gas and it spreads throughout the room. Now, you should know the three states of matter, solid liquid, gas, you should know a solid has definite shape and definite volume. A liquid has indefinite shape, definite volume, and a gas has definite shape, definite volume. If we are in the classroom right now, I do what I can't do online. Well, we can. I'd say class, everybody, let's go through the three states of matter and I'd have everybody say, come on, say it out loud, which you don't have to today, but you can do it mentally and I'll see if I can pick it up because I have ESP on. Actually, I have ESP too, but I'll talk about that another day. And I'd say, what's the first state of matter? And it's a solid. What's the second state? It's a, a liquid. And what's the third state? It's a gas. And you should know the definitions. Hint know these. Don't worry about incompressible 
or compressible. Now, when we talk about matter, you can have a pure substance. I'm never going to ask the definition that's composed of either one type of atom or molecule and only one substance is present and it cannot be separated into any other kinds of matter by physical means, not chemical, physical means. I won't ask that ever on a test. A mixture is when you have two things combined, but they each retain its chemical identity, meaning two or more substances, atoms or molecules. If I were to take salt and mix it into water or sugar, mix it into water, the sugar doesn't change, the water doesn't change. I'll never ask you what is a mixture. Again, I'm going through it a little quicker than I normally would, but you can go to the YouTube and see me do this at normal speed. When we talk about mixtures and compounds, we have elements. I'll never ask on a test, but an element is a pure substance that cannot be broken down into simpler substances by chemical or physical means. If you have a carbon atom or carbon or gold or silver, you can't break it down to anything smaller. Now, the other thing is a compound. And a compound is a pure substance, and sometimes I use interchangeably the term substance, which I shouldn't, but I make a mistake that way. But it's a pure substance that can be broken down to two or more simpler things by chemical means. And that would be, if you take water, I can break it down electri with electricity, the hydrogen and oxygen. So water, H2O, is a compound. And again, a mixture, I think I went through that already. Now, pay attention. When we talk about substances, we have both physical and chemical properties. And a property is a characteristic that distinguishes one substance from another. I'll never ask you what is a property. But when we talk about physical properties, those are characteristics of a substance that can be observed without changing the basic identity of a substance. An example would be color, also odor. And if we talk about physical properties, notice I've got my Ninja Black on today. And by the way, these are nice, almost feel like silk tops or t-shirts. Uh, but anyways, and you can see the color of the frames of my glasses. That's a physical property. Also, if we were to look at this, or better yet, in case I ran out of tea, water at room temperature, this wants to disappear. Hold on one second. If we look at water, it's a liquid at room temperature, the temperature. If I put this into a freezer and come back the next day, it's going to be a solid, not a liquid. And that's a physical property of water. Also, if I heat it up to a certain temperature, 100 degrees Celsius, that's measured temperature, 212 Fahrenheit, it will become a gas. It boils, and I'll teach you more about boiling. And you should know examples of physical properties. Another one, my file cabinet is black. It's a physical property. The wall here is not black. Those are physical properties. Now, we also have chemical properties. And that's a characteristic that describes the way chemical or substances undergo or resist change to form a new substance. An example of that would be if your car rusts. If your car rusts, certain steels will rust. For those of you who have ever seen Back to the Future or the other two, the DeLorean, the car they made into a time machine, is made of what's called stainless steel, which doesn't rust, which is why the DeLoreans were never painted. 
your cars are painted to protect the steel from rust. Now, other things, combustion explosions, I should tell you now, all organic chemists, or most I've known, when they were younger were secret pyromaniacs and we love to burn things. And what's the chemical property of water? It won't burn. It's used to put out fires. Now, paper. If I put a match under it, do not try this at home, this will burn. Paper is combustible or flammable. If I had gasoline, never try that. It will burn quite quickly. And that's a chemical property. Uh, another chemical property would be that the wax in a candle comes up in the wick and will burn. See, I'm a closet pyromaniac. And those are some examples of chemical properties. And you should know what's an example of a physical property, what's an example of a chemical property. Now, we have what's called physical and chemical changes. A physical change is a process in which the substance uh, changes its physical appearance, but it's still the same chemical composition. An example of that is if you have an ice cube and it melts, it goes from a solid to a liquid, that's a physical change. If I take a piece of paper and rip it in half, the paper is still that same chemical, but it's undergone a physical change. Now, the opposite of that, or not opposite, another type of change is a chemical change. And this is a process in which substance undergoes a change in composition. And I'll talk about it. We call that a chemical reaction, and I'll discuss that later. And what would be a chemical change? Well, if I burn a piece of paper, the paper undergoes a chemical change of, ooh, let me get personal. When you eat food and swallow it, chew it first or you'll choke. When I was little, my mother used to tell me when I was two or three, chew your food before you swallow or you'll choke. And guess what? She was right. I almost, by the way, I didn't die, but I choked once and luckily I got it out. But when it goes into your stomach, it undergoes changes, chemical changes that you didn't realize you have chemical changes going on in your body. Hope I didn't scare you. Again, I'm going quicker, but it's summer online. Look at my conservation of mass I'll talk about later. Energy, we'll talk about in the lab. I won't have anything to do types of energy I won't cover in this class. Energy measurements, calories, I won't. I'll skip this, I should have taken this out, I apologize. All right, there are three temperature scales, how we measure temperature, which is a way of measuring heat energy. One is Celsius, degree C, the other is Kelvin, K, and finally Fahrenheit, which is degrees F. And if I look at the clock, I'm out of time. Remember tomorrow, I'll spend a little time going through some of the problems on uh, chapter two problem set. One quick thing, uh, a couple of you have sent me emails with questions and you put in there, oh, I apologize for asking you a question or too many questions. Remember, in my class, there's no such thing as a dumb question, and you never, ever, ever, ever have to apologize for asking questions. Remember that. With that, I'll see you tomorrow at 9 o'clock. Make sure today you spend some time just logging into the Labster. There's no actual lab you have to do. And with that, gain gesund. Be healthy. I'll see you tomorrow. As Granny would say, bye.